you know the songs, sing them out in your living rooms, in your kitchens, in your bedrooms, in your cars. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, filled me with your peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but say, is a true God. You won't let us go. And you're with us today and always. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence Genesis Gathered Online. Uh, we are so thankful that you are here with us this morning. My name is Johnny Whitcomb. I am the student's pastor here at Genesis Church. I just want to say you guys could be doing a lot of things with your Sunday morning or your Sunday afternoon or your Tuesday morning. Whenever you're watching this video, um, you took time out of your day um, to step into church, even if it's digitally. We just want to thank you for that. It is an honor and a privilege to see you here. Of course, this Sunday is the first Sunday that we are gathering 
gathering back at the Genesis Center, and we just want to um, invite you back to the Genesis Center when the Lord leads you to come. You know, if you are saying, no, I'm not coming back um, to church quite yet, that is totally fine. We want you to take your time. We want you to be led by the Lord. Um, and so uh, in the meantime and in between time, we will keep broadcasting a special service online for you to watch as well. I have one thing that I want to talk to you about this week, uh, and that one thing is our upcoming summer baptisms. Now, we don't have a location or a date picked out for these baptisms yet, um, mainly because they're probably going to be outside, um, and we want at least the weather to be warm and the water to be warm before you get um, baptized. But if you have questions about baptism, if you do not know what baptism is, if you do not know why on earth a Christian would want to be dunked underwater by their pastor, um, that's why we want to put this on. On your radar so you can connect with us and learn more about um, the spiritual practice of getting baptized into the Christian faith. So if you want to get baptized, you can uh, text Genesis at 231-412-2866 to learn more about how you can learn more about baptism. Uh, and that is our one thing for the day. Uh, now at Genesis, we really value real stories. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Mike and he's going to share what ways God has been moving powerfully in his life. Let's all watch that together. He helped me see uh, the brokenness in my own life. He helped me see how far I had wandered from his path. I have probably been through every parent's nightmare. Have any direction as to which way I was going. I realized I had to surrender my will and my life over to God. Hi, Genesis. Happy Sunday. This is Mike Skydema. Just wanted to uh, give you a short message, a short testimony about what God has been doing in my life lately, which I find pretty exciting. Um, it hasn't necessarily always been fun or comfortable and definitely not something I would have chosen for my life, but um, transformative nonetheless. Uh, and what God has done is he's forced me to confront really um, the lukewarm Christian life I've been living for the past couple years. Um, sure, I would, you know, go to church on Sundays. If I could wake myself up early enough in the morning, I would even maybe read a devotional or a Bible passage. But that was about it. Uh, my faith was quite frankly on cruise control and probably more accurately um, on life support. Um, my job and my work and raising my family was far more important to me than my relationship with God. And while those things are good, positive things, obviously they shouldn't be the most important thing in your life. Um, now that's not something I consciously thought or admitted to myself, but it was true. Um, you know, I was the guy who always meant to go to man up, but I was too tired from working all day. I wanted to join a Bible study, but I didn't have the time. I didn't want to deal with the um, awkwardness, so I didn't, so I didn't do it. Um, I thought about reading the Bible every morning, um, but then I thought I needed my sleep more. And what made ma what made matters worse was that I was using alcohol as a crutch for the stresses in my life. I was drinking too much, too often, um, and God let me experience uh, the consequences of the way I was living, which is one of the best things that has ever happened in my life. I can say that unequivocally because for probably the first time ever, I realized how quickly all the earthly things I was building up could come crashing down, could fall away, disappear, um, and become pretty meaningless. Um, probably how a lot of us have been feeling over the past couple months during this quarantine. Uh, so what I did is I started um, intentionally making God a priority in my life, even if it wasn't easy or, or I didn't always want to. I started going to man up, spending time with other Christian guys who were trying to make God a priority in, in their lives. I started doing a weekly Bible study. I started waking up a little earlier to read the Bible in the morning. Um, and with this pretty simple foundation, my relationship with God has grown probably more in the past six months than in the previous six years. I feel more closely connected to God. I have a stronger prayer life. Um, I feel God speaking to me more through his word than ever before, which is probably because I have more of a heart to listen. Um, and with the help of some people in, in this church family, 
I've completely cut alcohol out of my life and um, I don't even miss it most of the time. Um, you know, the Bible says that God corrects and loves and disciplines everyone he loves. Uh, so I take comfort in that truth because God has been loving on me a lot lately. Um, but I'm very grateful for everything he's done in my life and everything that this church family has done for me and my family. Thanks and uh, have a great Sunday. Good morning, Genesis. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a perfect father, a father who loves us unconditionally, a father who waits eagerly for our return when we stray, a father who's always willing to forgive, a father who listens and comforts us in times of need, a father who provides and protects us, and a father who relentlessly pursues us and paved our way to a heavenly home through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus. During this time, Lord, we also we want to pray for wisdom and guidance as we begin to re-engage in face-to-face -face church activities. Lord, we pray for protection and safety. We also continue to pray for all of the frontline workers who have continued to provide an array of services during this pandemic. Lord, my heart also aches over all the evil being unearthed over racial issues. Lord, forgive us for being blinded by privilege, blinded by ignorance, blinded by misunderstanding and lack of empathy, blinded by pride and entitlement, which has created divide, unrest, violence and hatred, which are all wet weapons of Satan. Lord, restore our peace, soften our hearts, open our eyes so we can see the role we may have played in all of this. Lord, forgive us and help us seek forgiveness from those we may have wronged. Lord, give us hearts of compassion and ears that truly can hear the cries of our hurting, wounded and angry brothers and sisters. Lord, send your spirit of reconciliation and set our hearts on fire to be an active agent in restoration. Heavenly Father, I also want to pray that you be with our leaders locally, nationally and globally. Give them wisdom and guidance even though they may not acknowledge your presence. Lord, speak directly to their hearts and let us not forget that you, Lord, are sovereign and mighty to save. Lord, this week we also pray for our kingdom partners, say families. Bless this organisation that provides safe respite to families in times of need. Several families already are actively participating at this program in this church opening up their homes to children in need. Stir our hearts, Lord, today so that more families will want to become involved in this ministry. Lord, we want to have intentional lives. Our time is short on this earth. Nonetheless, you have work for each of us to do. Speak to each of our hearts and give us boldness and courage to step out in your name to proclaim your gospel to our families and community. Heavenly Father, we also pray for a blessing on our earthly fathers. Rise up the dads in this church to be strong leaders you are calling them to be in their families and in this community. Heavenly Father, soothe the brokenhearted whose fathers were not a loving presence in their lives. Thank you as our Heavenly Father, you never abandon us. You love us unconditionally and we never suffer abuse at your hand. You are a strong tower. You are our protector, our provider and lover of our souls. We love you, Lord, and today we worship you. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious and saving name. Amen. Let's just think on the Lord this morning and how good he really is to us. We are his children, and he's with us always.
for my heart before even time began my life was in his hand he knows my name he knows my age that falls and he hears me when I call and I have a father he calls me his own He'll never leave me, no matter where I go. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear. That falls, and he hears me when I call. Let's sing that one more time. I have a maker, he formed my heart. time began my life was in his hand he knows my name he knows my every thought he sees each tear for Turn with me to Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9, and 20 and 21, found on page 222 in your journey Bible. Deuteronomy 6. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them, may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all the decrees, commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, and when you lie down and when you wake up. Tie them 
as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Verse 20. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of these stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Thank you, Eugene. And happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. This passage that Eugene just read is from the first part of the Bible called the Jewish Bible or the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, many call it. And it has all the marks of kind of Hebrew writing. It's got lots of repetition. It's got metaphors. It's got figurative language. It's a, it's a pretty big passage teaching a basic thought. And what is the thought? What is the teaching here? At a very general level, at a very inclusive level, the passage is teaching to be an influencer of younger people. Be an influencer of those who are younger. Like for parents, use your role in your children's life to help them to know and follow the Lord. And, and fathers, you know, it's your big day, fathers. Use your position in their lives to impact them for God. But, but really for anyone, in addition, anyone who has the potential to influence younger people, whether it be grandparents, uh, whether it be uncles, aunts, friends, coaches, teachers, really anyone, because the list goes on and on, show them. Show these people that you have influence in their life. Show them the goodness of God. Let it flow from you as you walk with them on the way. Let them hear it. Let them see it. And let them be able to join in it. But you know, we can't just wake up and put on our, you know, our hat, our draw people to God hat in the morning. We, we just can't do that. It, it doesn't work that way. It's got to be something that's really deeply seated within us. It just doesn't work that way because we must live intentionally. We must live intentionally. We must live on purpose for what matters most. That's how we can produce that that's how we can be able to be the influencer that we need to be. But we have to first live intentionally. We have to live on purpose for what matters most. And, and quite frankly, that is not easy to do. It takes effort and it takes work to be in a position where you are influencing younger people with the goodness of God. Look at what it says over in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Now, this is a passage that is in the New Testament, and it's at the time of, of Greek thought, which was more propositional. It was less repetitive and less story-driven and figurative language and just kind of straightforward, very direct and brief. And let's look at it here. It says, Fathers... Do not exasperate your children. Don't embitter them, in other words. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction in the Lord. This is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. You see, it doesn't just happen. It has to flow from you. You don't wake up training and instructing your kids your children in the way of the Lord. It just doesn't work that way. It must flow from within. The only way to get there is to live intentionally. Live intentionally now. Live on purpose for what matters now. But people do live on purpose for something. Most people do. They live on purpose for a reason. And, and many of those reasons aren't the most important things. They aren't the things that matter most. Well, let's go back three months. Much of uh, what we were 
living for, let's say three months ago, was, uh, was taken away. It was stripped away. Uh, we were confined to our homes. Uh, we were under each other's feet. Uh, I, I know not everyone was. I know some people, um, you, are, you live by yourself, and this has been a challenging thing uh, in another way of, with loneliness and with being you know, kind of pulled away from everybody. But for, for those that have family, it's like you're, you're on top of each other, you're, you're stuck at home, and uh, it, it was a very difficult time. And I, I want to use the word weird. It was a weird time. And there's, there's kind of weird bad and there's weird good. And there was a lot of weird bad. I mean, for a pastor, uh, it's just really unnatural to not have any kind of in-person contact with people. And I, I suffered through the time with a lot of ups and downs, a lot of struggles in that way. But, you know, there was some weird good. <laughs> and like for me, one of the weird good <laughs> was this uh, thing like having my message done and completed on Thursday and having it video captured Thursday night. It was great, man. I actually had a weekend. You see, that is weird good <laughs> for a pastor. And But there was, there was more weird good. I mean, some people, they, they spent more time. Many people told me they were spending more time with God. They were having more time in prayer and study and, and actually times of solitude, prayer walks, things like that. And, and you know, one thing I found is I, I had a lot of contact with people via Zoom or on the phone um, that a lot of people were willing to jump in and help out and serve in many unique ways during that three-month uh, time when we were in lockdown. Um, Many more told me about time with family. They were having just incredible time with family, you know, game nights and, and all kinds of fun and things like that. And here's the thing. What we learned in that time, what we were reminded about in that time is that time with God is important. Having connection with God and and having him help us that we can call out to him and having him help us in this time. You know, finding scriptures that touch our heart and give us comfort in the uncertainty that we're facing. And, and you know, then spending ample time with the family, you know, having game nights and movie nights and things like that. Um, I've heard just a lot of people say this was an incredible time for them in that way. Again, weird good. But now, for many, it's back to work. And it, it, it's back to scratching out a living. And, and that's appropriate. It's, it's what we need to be doing. Uh, but many, and I'm talking a little bit to guys here, you know, it's like, I got to make up time now. I've got to make up for those weeks of missed time. And so what we're at risk of doing is missing the biggest lesson that the coronavirus crisis reminded us or taught us, you know, that, that idea that being with God and connecting with him and having time for family, we're, we're kind of, we can miss that and we can just kind of begin to lower our heads and begin to plow through, to begin to try to catch up and try to do the things that we believe we need to do. And what happens is we're going to return to that and we're going to begin to neglect God. We're going to begin to minimize our family interaction. So I want to talk to men right now. It's Father's Day again. Uh, so listen up, men. Talk specifically to you. Uh, you know, I want to talk to fathers and those that are not yet fathers. And uh, it's important to understand how your heart works. And I know this is generalization. It's just general, but it, it, it is true for most um, in these generalizations, I'm going to share a couple of them come from our, our Tuesday morning teaching meeting, our round table. Uh, so I'm going to blame the other guys, Will Hennigan, Scott Garziella, uh, Dane Rasper, and Johnny uh, Whitcomb. Um, that's, our, that's our teaching team here at Genesis. And, uh, you know, we're just wrestling and talking through this. What's at the heart of man? And what prompts us to diverge away from that connection with God and that 
investment into our families. And one thing that we came up with is, is the heart of man longs for mission. The heart of man, we long to have a mission, an adventure that we are trying to accomplish. We're, men tend to try to invest themselves into something that they could die for. Something that is bigger than themselves. Men are strivers and, and getters. <laughs> One of the guys said that. And the big question is, what are you striving for? What, what are you trying to get? What is it that you want? And, and really, what are you dying for? We all need to really think about this. I'm going to put this quote up here, this question here. Are we trading a good thing for a God thing? Is that you? Are you trading a good thing for a God thing? Now, Jesus said it this way. You may be familiar with the passage. It's in the Sermon on the Mount, so we're going to deal with that passage a little bit more later on. But Jesus said that we can gain the whole world and yet lose our soul. We can gain the whole world. We can gain all the accomplishments of our workplace. And we can lose our soul. We can be successful at what we do. And we can lose everything that really matters. We can gain a great business and destroy our marriage. We can have an incredible pastime that we're very good at and neglect our kids. You know, work can be a good thing. Golf can be a good thing. Although for me, golf and good do not go in the same sentence, okay? But they're not an end. They're not the ultimate. You fill in the blank, okay? Finding purpose and meaning in the Lord. That's where it's at. Finding peace, uh, purpose and meaning in the Lord and finding what pleases him and anchoring your heart to that. That's what matters. And that is what is going to help us to influence others in our lives. Everything that we have, everything that we have, whether it be work, financial, hobbies, etc., we need to hold loosely. We need to hold them loosely and hold on and lean into the one, the ultimate one. All these things, business, work, hobbies, they're all seconds. They're all seconds to knowing God and to having his continued presence in our lives. Now, I want to talk to single people because single people can be looking for Mrs. Right or Mr. Right. I mean, everybody that's been single in their lives, they know that temptation. They understand. But to, to seek Mrs. Right or Mr. Right can become an ultimate thing very easily. But it needs to be second. It needs to come after trusting the Lord. It needs to come after surrendering all to him. You see, when you're intentional about your relationship with God and, and then his presence is in your life, he's with you, he begins to transform you. He begins to change you. He begins to create in you newness that is very attractive to others and that actually feeds the others that are closest to you. It influences them. You see, God is transforming you. He will renew you and he will reveal more and more to you, more things to you, more priorities to you. And, and this priority here that it's God first, others second, and self last. That piece right there. God first, others second, and self last. And th this is a purpose to live for. So you can evaluate your life on this. You can evaluate your life on this. Is God first, are others second, and is self last? It, it, it's going to express truth by thinking through that, and I encourage you to do so. So how do you become intentional? How do you become intentional about God and his ways and his purposes instead of your own personal ones. How do, you, how do you switch? How do you move that? 
Well, the first thing here is that you must find your identity in what is truly important. Not in things that are secondary, but what is truly important. Uh, let's go to that passage again in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 21. At the very end, we, we find the identity here of the Israelite. Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You know, uh, th this passage, it rings true to what we've been discovering in the Sermon on the Mount. This idea of being poor in spirit. That's what is represented here. This father is teaching his son, remember way back when we were slaves in Egypt. We were in bondage. We were helpless. We were poor. And yet God, by his mighty right hand, he rescued us. He intervened. He came to us and he saved us. And that's the identity that that father was choosing to, to make as his identity. And the question is, what is your identity? What do you draw your worth from? What do you draw your identity from? Everything that we have, if you're a follower of Jesus, you need to continue to remind yourself and to work this out in your life that everything that you have is because of the Lord. Every stewardship that you enjoy is because of his goodness. And, and then choose to live in a way that, is, that reflects gratitude and reminds yourself of that very truth. And that your whole life is of service to him, not for yourself. Now, here's the thing. We can take the easier thing over the better thing. Think with me about that. We can do what is easier instead of what is better. And this is a, this is a temptation for men and for others to do what is easier instead of what is better. Because what is better is usually harder. It's not easier. It's harder. It's harder to do. But when we gravitate towards the things, here's something we need to watch out for. When we're gravitating towards the things where we get the most positive feedback, that is a warning light. Because at work, we will be complimented for our good work. And in hobbies and things like this, we will be complimented because of our abilities and so on and so forth. And what happens then is that we can tend to gravitate then toward those activities because we're hearing the positives. We're getting the positive feedback. But following the Lord in his ways, we don't always get that positive feedback. As a matter of fact, Jesus told us that we may be persecuted for following him. And if we stand up for him, others may... Um, not want friendship with us or not, may not respect us. But we need to overcome that temptation. We need to double down on our identity, which is in Christ. So the, the first is, being to, to be intentional, is to have an identity that is centered in Christ. And the second piece here is there needs to be visibility we need to work towards putting it out there. That's what this passage is talking about, you know, um, up there in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's talking about wearing it on your head, wearing it on your arm, marking it on your, your um, doorposts of your house, making it known, being visible about your faith, not hidden, not, not down here, but putting it out there, living it out before your peers, your coworkers, but most importantly, living it out in front of your children, in front of those that you're influencing. And, and I want to say this again. Those that you're influencing, they need to hear it. They need to hear you say it. They need to see it. They need to see you living it. And there needs to be a way where they can join you in it. You need to walk with them on the way. You need to invite them in. Now, here's what I want you to imagine. 
I want you to imagine not a lockdown situation, not the governor, not anyone else saying that you have to stay home and now you've got time to read the Bible and spend time with your family. I want you to imagine you intentionally choosing that. You intentionally choosing to prioritize God, who he is and his way and pleasing him, surrendering all to him. I want you to imagine that. And then I want you to imagine him, God, transforming you, taking away your selfish bent and making him into the man that he wants you to be, the person that he wants you to be, where you are serving others, you are aware of others, and you are taking a back seat. You are becoming more and more selfless. I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine what that will be like for those around you. If you're married, your wife. If you have children, your children. If you're a coach, the kids that you coach, the people you teach. I want you to imagine what God would do. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it points us to leverage our life for things that truly matter. May we be willing to surrender to you today, Lord. May we be willing to make you the one that is ultimate in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Norm, for um, leading us to the Bible, um, giving us that incredible teaching on what it means to live intentionally this Father's Day. Uh, now I have a couple next steps for us as a church um, and specifically for men and fathers as well. Uh, the first next step I have for you guys is a question, actually. It's a question of how are you living? Are you living the easy way or the right way. I think um, Jesus, on his journey to cross, he definitely did not do the easy thing. But I praise God that he did the right thing and that he followed the will of his father all the way to his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, because he chose the right path, we now as Christians have eternal life. And so I just want to challenge you as a Christian, are you living that kind of a life out? Examine your week. Examine the way that you go through life. Are you doing it the easy way, the less intentional way, the way that puts life on autopilot? Or are you intentionally living in such a way that, yeah, it might be difficult, but it is the right and God-honoring way to live life? Are you living intentionally? Are you living right? And secondly, our second next step is a challenge for the whole church to practice journaling. Now, uh, this doesn't mean that you have to have a pink diary with your name on the cover and a little lock on the side, but it does mean that you are going to take this challenge and record what you do in life, how you navigate life. I think um, one of the elements to becoming a better follower of Jesus Christ is to realize and record and write down and capture how you're following him right now. You know, you'll see patterns, you'll see um, different um, emotions coming up, reoccurring in your life if you journal. And when you do that, you can see the good, the bad, and the ugly. You can see um, the places where you're progressing. You're growing more like Jesus Christ. You're seeing prayers answered. Um, you're seeing breakthrough happen in your life. And you're also seeing the areas where you need to surrender more to Jesus. Um, and both of those are incredibly good things to recognize and to realize in our Christian faith and journaling and taking captive our thoughts, taking captive our actions and lives is one of the ways that you can do that. So those are our two next steps. One, examine your life and ask the question, am I doing the easy thing or the right thing? And number two, try journaling. You know, it might not work for you. It might not be something that benefits you. But throughout the ages, Christians have um, been doing this. This is a practice that we've been about. Um, and, and thank God that we have because uh, there's some great lessons to be learned from journaling. So those are our two next steps for the day, Genesis. Again, I'm so glad to see everybody here today. And uh, now let's turn our attention back to worship. Lost. 
lost, but he brought me in all his love for me. All his love for me. For the sun sets free, always free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I He has ransomed me, all his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me, with the sun sets free, all is free indeed. I'm a child. together wherever you are this morning. It's a declaration of faith. Responding our hearts together with God. Okay. 
Let's go. 